Welcome to the section for leases according to the IFRS number 16. So first of all, I always tell my students that if you want to have an asset, you've got two choices to do that. Perhaps the first choice is you're going to buy it from the seller. And that means the seller will simply sell it to you and you simply buy it, buy the asset from the seller. Or perhaps you're going to lease the asset and if that's the case you are lessee and it is the lessor who's going to lease the asset to you or rent the asset from the lessor if you like and that means you've got two choices there and we're going to focus upon if I were to lease the asset from the lessor and what would be the accounting treatment related to this transaction from the lessee as well as the lessor's point of view. So, just to give you an overview for that, for lease accounting for a lessee's point of view, because now the lessor is giving the asset up, especially for the right to use that asset to the lessee. And if that's the case then, first of all, from lessee's point of view, we're going to recognise something called the right of use asset to stand for the fact that we've got this right to use this asset. But before we do that, of course, it's absolutely key later on so that we're going to identify whether or not this contract contains an asset or whether or not we've got the right to control it or to control the use of it and also to gain the economic benefit from it. And from the lessee's point of view, because now we are not going to buy the asset from the lessor, perhaps we simply pay for the rental payment to the lessor. And if that's the case then, we're going to recognise the liability, we can call it the lease liability, to stand for the fact that this will be the money that we owed to the lessor. And of course, that's one way that we can... Um, see how we're going to account for the uh, lease transactions for the lessee. Of course, we will also see the exemption for that later on. From lessor's point of view, on the other hand, it will be the same as what we've seen in the old accounting standard, which is the IAS number 17, lease accounting. And that means from a lessor's point of view, we're going to identify uh, the circumstances where if the transaction is the finance lease or perhaps it would just to be the operating lease and of course the accounting treatment will be different in these two circumstances. Okay, now we've talked about the objective for the IFR 16 survey and you will see the effective date is from 1st January 2019. If you were to adopt the IFR 16 it would be better for you to adopt the IFRS 15, it's the revenue from contract with customers, because both of these accounting standards will be talking about the standalone price and how we're going to allocate the transaction price according to that percentage. So we will see in a second. And you will see also for the scope for the IFRS number 16, but does not contain for those intangible assets being covered by IS38, agriculture accounting, etc. I will see shortly uh, if we've got the circumstance where we're going to recognise the transaction and we're going to measure it uh, like a service contract according to the IFRS number 15. So we're going to see that shortly. Okay, so first of all, then, the IFRS 16 just tells us whether or not it will be a lease contract. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to um, take you through to our notes. I'm going to explain those bits and pieces for you. So first of all then, if you want to apply the lease accounting, the first step that you need to do is you have to make sure that this will be a lease contract. So first of all, it should be a contract. And secondly, 
from Lessee's point of view, for example, we've got a right to control the use of an identified asset. So, so you can see then, if you haven't got the right to control the asset, from Lessee's point of view in particular, we cannot recognise the right of use assets, can we? And secondly, if that's not related to an asset, of course, we're not going to apply these accounting standards for it. Because as I said, if you want to have an asset, you've got two ways. Either you're going to buy it, or perhaps you're going to lease it. And that's the reason why these two key words, the rights to control, as well as the identified asset, will be absolutely key. We'll see that shortly. So we've got a right to control the asset, such as the building or the office space, for example. So we can uh, work in that office and generate into future economic benefits, and that's good. And here is for a period of time. So we're going to see the lease term in a, se in a second. So if you want to lease the asset, it will be pointless if you say it's for free. So in exchange for consideration, which means the least liability of how we're going to determine that, we're going to see that shortly as well. And of course, as I said, if you want to rent an office in the real life, perhaps the lessor will give you some incentive by giving you, by offering you some of the, um, the free of charge period um, for, for the rental for that office as an incentive. So we're going to see how we're going to cheat that or how we're going to account for it shortly. So, let me just point out here. The key words for a lease contract is first of all, you've got the right to control the asset. And we will see whether or not we've got a right to control the asset. It will be really based upon the DE, it's my own mnemonics for this. The D would be whether or not we've got the right to direct the use of an asset. Okay. So, in directing the use of the asset, we're going to see whether or not the lessee will be able to decide why we're going to use it, when we're going to use it, and how we're going to use it. So, let me just to give you an example related to the car. If you want to rent a car, so for example, want to lease a car, according to the terms and condition, you can use that car in that particular day. So for example, you can use that car and drive on the road, it's entirely up to you. If that's the case, it will show uh, in the contracts that you've got the right to control the use of an asset and you fulfil the definition for the first one, is the right to control the asset. Perhaps in some of the contract, in particular, it will detail that if you want to rent a car, you cannot use the car in this area. But you can, of course, use that car in that particular area. So according to the terms and condition, this would be an example of the protective right. But it is not because of the protective right exists, so you haven't got the right to control the asset, this is wrong, even though we've got the protective right for that, we still got the right to control the use of an asset. It still fulfills the definition for the first one. It's to direct the use of an asset. Secondly, you will get the future economic benefit from the use of the asset. So it's quite important that you understand that concept. So, for example, if you want to rent the pipeline, not only you will get, for example, the petrol or diesel, but perhaps you will also get, maybe, the byproduct such as the gasoline. So, getting the future economic benefit, perhaps you will get the prime product, such as what we've seen, petrol or diesel, or perhaps we will get 
the gasoline is an example of a byproduct. But uh, either way, you've got the future economic, bit, uh, economic benefit from it. And hence, you've got uh, the rights to direct the use of an asset, and you can obtain the uh, future economic benefit so that uh, you will have the rights to control the asset. So you can call it the DE. Secondly, in order to fulfill uh, the definition of lease contracts for the second one, is where this asset should be identified. This is a quite key term, really. So the identified asset can also either be explicitly identified or implicitly identified. So first of all, let me explain what do I mean by explicitly identified asset. So according to the terms and condition that I allow you to use that computer, that computer we have specified that in the contract already, including its serial number, including its value, etc. And if that's the case then, then that would be an example of the explicitly identified asset because that has been specified already. The question is, what do I mean by implicitly identify them? Well, implicitly identified assets would be an example of capacity proportion. The capacity portion, let's say, We've got an office, and if I were to rent an office, perhaps that um, a kind of lease contract would, would simply say, um, I'm not going to specify which area that you're going to rent. You simply rent an office, for example, 60 square meters. So perhaps you can locate an office here for 60 square meters in that place. 60 square meters, but I haven't specified that at all. So, if this is the case, if I haven't specified uh, where would that 60 square meters um, space is, that is not identified. It is not implicitly identified. So it's important that you understand that, so for example, you are leasing the capacity portion of it. You're not leasing the full asset, for example. So that's what I mean by implicitly identified. So if that's the case, then first of all, uh, in order to fulfill the implicitly identified asset, first of all, we need to make sure that it's distinct asset. We can call it the D for distinct, which means we've specified the area uh, that we are going to locate in. So, so for example, 60 square meters, we're going to uh, specify that 60 square meters will be here, not there. If that's the case, that's implicitly identified. If not, we need to account for it according to IFAS number 15. It's a service contract. Secondly, if the asset is not distinct, but in certain circumstances it can also be an implicitly identified asset. If we'll get substantially all of its benefits or all of its capacity, of the asset. So, for example, again, if you were to lease a pipeline, if you were to lease a pipeline, perhaps you only lease 50% of its usage, and if that's the case, that does not fulfill this criteria, because you can, all, you can only get 50% of its capacity. But if you say to me, that I will get or I will lease 95% of its usage, although it is not specified, it's not distinct, which means um, 
they haven't specified which portion that you're leasing but again because I will get substantially all of its capacity of assets for example 95% of its usage it will be seen as the identified asset in this way okay so or or DA distinct or, or substantially all not 100% but substantially all of its capacity of an asset we can determine that it will be an identified asset so if you fill these two criteria as you can see let me just to go back to the notes again we can confirm that this lease contract would be a lease contract so a lease contract would be a contract contains the lease if first of all it conveys the rights to control the use of an asset and secondly this asset should be identified and hence we need to determine that for a period of time and also in exchange of the consideration which means payment so after we confirm that this will be a lease contract the next things that we're going to do if you turn back to uh, two pages after this pa uh, 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 two pages of your note you will see the components in a contract so let me just to point out first of all from the lessee's point of view we've got an option to either we're going to separate the components from the contract for example for the lease and non-lease components the lease components will be an example of the asset itself the non-lease components will be an example for the maintenance surveys related to the contract or we are not going to separate those components it's entirely up to you either way it will be absolutely fine but from the lessor's point of view on the other hand what we need to do we've got no choice but to allocate the consideration based upon the standard loan price for those assets as well as the maintenance expenses so the best way to show this from my perspective is to go through a question called introductory I will show you how we're going to separate the components of a contract in this particular question at the same time we will be going through the accounting for it from the lessee's point of view so required first of all how to account for the above lease from the lessee or and also from the lessor's perspective so introductory POC has leased several assets from the lessor and the total consideration paid to those assets for two years is $5,000 okay so that for, for that $5,000 so perhaps all we can do from the option one's point of view so let me just to write out here first of all going to account for it from the lessee's point of view the option one is not to consider any of these components within the lease which means not separating the components contains in the contract and if that's the case then for that five thousand dollars we're going to mix them up by simply debiting the right of use asset in a non-current asset in the statement of financial position we're going to credit the lease liability of five thousand dollars job done and of course in subsequent years if that asset uh, should be accounted for according to ice number 16 property plant equipment we need to depreciate that but if that asset relates to for example ice number 40 investment property perhaps we need to use or adopt the fair value model by revaluing it uh, and take the gains and losses to the PL each and every year it really depends upon uh, which assets that you're going to talk about and for lease liability 
all we need to do because that five thousand dollars would just to be the present value of the pin minimum lease payment which means we have already discounted the future uh, lease payment to today's terms and what we need to do then in each and every subsequent years we need to unwind it or unwind the liability up by accounting for the finance costs as well as the reduction in the lease liability by setting that Okay, so that's the option one. So, what I'd like to do then is I'm going to see how we're going to account for it from the option two's point of view, where we're going to separate the lease as well as the non lease components. So, if we go back to that particular example, we're going to see the standalone price for each of these lease components, which means the asset. For example, within the lease components, we've got the asset one as well as the asset two. As well as the non lease components, such as the maintenance surveys that we need to undertake because we are leasing that asset we need to maintain that for maintenance costs it's five thousand dollars so that's the standalone price which means it's like the fair value in the marketplace if you were to buy it separately so all we need to do then is this our aim is to allocate that five thousand dollars is the consideration in a lease contract so remember and just to remind you uh, about the knowledge from the lease contract that we've seen before a lease contract is the lease contract it's a contract that can raise the rights to you to 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 use the assets uh, uh, the assets should be identified in a period of time uh, it's for two years in other words and in exchange um, of his consideration which means five thousand dollars so all we can do for the option so is going to allocate that five thousand according to the standalone price if you total the standalone price together and that would be fifty thousand dollars this would take thirty thousand plus hundred uh, plus fifteen thousand plus five thousand that will give me fifty thousand in total the asset one the standalone price is thirty thousand accounts for 3 over 5 which means 60% of its value we take 30,000 divided by a total of 50,000 and 15,000 on the other hand 15,000 divided by 50,000 so that would be 30% 30, 30 for that and that would be the remaining of 10% for 5,000 account for a total of 10% of 50,000 so all we can do, of course, we will separate that. Um, for example, for that five thousand, um, we're gonna uh, times sixty and thirty percent for the asset. So we're gonna recognise the right of use asset first of all. But for the remainder of the maintenance costs, and that will be an example of the non-lease components. Um, all we can do is gonna expense that to a statement of profit or loss. So that's the reason why we've got two options for that. So option two then is going to separate the lease and non lease component where well, we're going to debit the lease component for the right of use asset, which means those assets. In this case, we've got asset one, we're going to allocate 60% for that 5,000 and also for 30% of that 5,000. So if you total them up, and that will be $4,500, that will be the right of use asset. At the same time, you're going to credit the lease liability again for $4,500. Okay. But how about for non-lease components related to that maintenance service? As I said, for maintenance service, we're going to debit the expense for that maintenance cost 
But should we debit a total of 5,000 or simply 10% of that 5,000? Of course, the answer is 10% of the consideration in the lease contract worth 5,000. Now, it's a present value of the minimum lease payment. So the expense we're going to provide for will be 5,000, but that 5,000 is not the standalone price for the maintenance costs, for only 10%. And that would be 500. I would credit the lease liability worth of $500. Okay. So that's how we deal with the initial measurements, but for illustrated purposes, uh, for the first of our section, I'm not going to go through the subsequent measurements for that. Of course, we will leave that later on. So, what else that we are told? We are also told in the bottom that it's $100 of the admin costs that the company will need to pay for to reimburse the lessor's tax charge. So, effectively, we are compensating for their losses, for the tax that they suffered. But from the IFRS number 16's point of view, it said for those admin costs, we are not going to consider that into a lease contract. I mean, to separate them out. And that means we pay for that $100 already. So we need to do for the admin costs. It's going to debit the expense of $100 and credit cash that pay for it already for $100. So, just to recap of what we've done, from the lessee's point, we've got two options. First of all, we can directly recognise that present value of the minimum lease payments worth $5,000 into debiting the right of use asset and crediting the lease liability by 5,000. Alternatively, we can set put that 5,000 into the lease and non-lease component based upon their standalone prices percentage. And of course, for non-lease components, we are not going to debit the right of use asset, but we simply debit the expense. So for example, for those, for those maintenance costs, for the admin costs, we simply credit cash and we debit the expense for that. So, from a lessor's point of view, it will really depend upon whether or not it will be a finance or operating lease, and we haven't specified that here in this particular example. And hence, from a lessor's point of view, all we need to do is to account for it. For example, we receive the money from the lessee, uh, and, and that would be a revenue and hence needs to be accounted for according to IFRS number 15. And of course, we'll be going through the accounting for lessor uh, in a later section. Don't worry about that. Okay. So, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to stop here for the first of our section for the IFRS number 16 and hope you find it not very, very complicated. So, in the next of our session onwards, we'll be first of all going through some of the key definitions according to IFRS 16, and also going through a lot of examples for that, and um, we'll see each other in the next session onwards. Bye for now then. APC, accounting for your future.